Hello and welcome to an Infinity the Game tournament recap. This is for the Anzac Cup charity event, which was run by the Australian Defence Wargaming Association this weekend in Canberra ACT, and we were lucky enough to have a significant delegation from Melbourne as well as some people from Sydney come down to play. So that was awesome. I'm playing Starmada for this. We are kicking off in round two, but I'll explain why that is as we get into the game. So this is the list that I would play for all three rounds of the event. I knew that I wanted to play either Starmada or O12 for this, um, because but these are recently updated armies, and I kind of knew I didn't want to play Bakunin or Nomads, mostly because we just have a lot of Bakunin or Nomad players in Canberra, and I didn't want to cut their grass. Uh, so after playing a few games, I eventually came to the conclusion that I'm going to play Starmata for this, and that's mostly because I kept falling into what I would call like old habits with O12. O12 have pieces that I really like, but the list that I was making were gravitating more and more toward more and more towards just hack Islam with extra steps, maybe with one bigger gun, but with like motorized bounty hunters instead of Kum riders and cyber ghosts instead of. Um, Barids and Epsilons instead of Muktars, and it was just kind of a worse version of a worse version of Hack Islam that like had a robot instead of a Fade, but otherwise was just less efficient across the board. And I wanted to force myself out of that archetype. So the decision was we're gonna play Starmada. And after I had something like two games with O12, four games with Starmada, not really enough for a pre-tournament kind of like testing regime, but I settled on this. And I would play this in all three games, and I was pretty happy with it. One of the restrictions I set myself was that I knew I didn't want to play a Kappa core. Now, a Kappa core is really good. You will usually run it with two Raven Eye officers, two Kappa hackers, and a Kappa sniper. And it is a decent little fire point if you're willing to just roll three dice on 15s with the sniper. And you have a lot of utility from both the hackers and the Raven Eyes. But I don't like running five man light infantry cores. They're just not my style. I find that they are fine, but I don't want to commit five models to one part of the board for a relatively static position. And so this is kind of the compromise that I came up with to give me access to the same utility and same like, you know, incredible uh, value for money, I guess you'd say, of the Kappas and the Raven Eyes, but get more active firepower, be able to spread my forces a little bit, and generally have a bit more of that flexibility that I like, even if I'm playing sectorals. So what we're running here is two three-man links. Each of them is composed of a Psycop, a Kappa, a Hacker, and a Raven Eye Officer. And because they're two three-man links, they can play on completely different sides of the battlefield, and I found that really let me get kind of the best out of them. I could have the mines in different places, the hacking in different places. The Psychop is an extremely serviceable active turn firefighter, if gunfighter, if it's got plus one burst from a link team, even if it doesn't, but it's particularly good going from burst three to burst four. And it's also not a bad ARO piece if it absolutely has to be in ARO because it's ballistic skill 13, MSV1, mimetism, firing double action rounds at burst two. That's not going to light the world on fire, but it's not bad, and in many respects, it's better than a Kappa Sniper. So two of these links were the backbone of this list. We have a second link there. And those those Psychops were basically the firepower that I found I could fit in kind of the mid-range. And that's something that I'd found with Starmada kind of generally, is they have two good choices for top-end firepower. One of them, obviously, is the Zeta, which was going to appear in this list. And then the other is a um, if you run a beta link with an Epsilon in it. And that Epsilon, if it's a three or five man link, is really good. Usually the Epsilon Sniper, because you need access to firepower that can kill a tag. But that thing can be rolling in at anything up to Ballistic Skill 16, Burst 3, Mimetism, MSV2, Smoke Shooting. And it's really fun to play, but it's Burst 1 and you can't really put it as an ARO piece unless you're willing to get lucky, and it's just assuming quite a lot of risk, even in a five-man beta team, which does have the Spitfire as a really good backup gun, but the Spitfire can't engage a tag. And in the, these scenarios, and basically after about four games, and in particular four games into stuff like Nomads, Nomads, and more Nomads, this is what I settled on. The rest of the list is really defined by these two roadbot links. So in each combat group, we've got a paramedic roadbot and an Oko. I initially, I think I've had games with Red Fury, uh, Marksman Rifle, Light Shotgun, and paramedic roadbots. And the paramedic roadbots are a little bit of a concession to the scenario mix. They're going to be particularly relevant in the highly classified that we would be playing. But they also, I found, they just kind of did a lot of the things that I wanted to. Because they've got 
uh, a riot stopper and a submachine gun, that's not as good as a burst three shotgun and a marksman rifle, but it's very close to as good, and there are times when the riot stopper is better. Also, the paramedic is a specialist. Also, the paramedic has a panzerfaust. Also, the paramedic is like three points cheaper, and those three points add up. Another version of this list that I played at one point had one roadbot and then a 20-point um, lawkeeper, which probably was would have been better for rescue, but only slightly better. But these things are just useful. And frankly, I would run face-first into hacking way too many times. Uh, in the testing games that I played, I did have games where roadbots engineered a breakthrough, they smashed through my opponent's lines, they circumvented hacking, and then they killed a whole bunch of stuff. But what I increasingly found is the more people got used to defending them, the less likely they were to be able to punch through a repeater network, because they're not like a Sujan, they're not heavy infantry, they're a remote, so they can't cautious move. But they can, they are cheap enough to just run across the field and park somewhere annoying, and just have them be your opponent's problem. And that was super interesting and really good, and I would use them in that capacity. Other than that, we have two Varangians because smoke is really, really good. Varangians are not pieces that I'm particularly in love with. They are really just bad Datarazi, but even a bad Datarazi is still pretty good, and I want my Fizz 14 smoke. We then have a Lambda, uh, an engineer with one Yudbot, who is mostly there for the Zeta, but there are many things to repair in this list, and a Warcor. A Warcor is a piece that I'm putting in most Starmada lists because it is literally the only irregular. And so I have four command tokens. And frankly, in a lot of games, I'm going to save three of those command tokens for the inevitable loss of lieutenant turn because I'm running a Zeta lieutenant with no chain of command. But otherwise, the Warcore's order gets converted a lot. And for three points, cool. It's another saving over, like, I could put a Flash Pulse bot in, but I'd have to find four points to do that, which would mean cutting something like the Psychop. And there's really no fat left in this list. So this is what I ended up with, and I basically, I really liked it. I played this all four games. I'm probably not going to play it again, because I've just played it in a four-round event. So I played it for three games of a four-round event. Uh, but it was fun, and I can highly recommend it. Just for clarity, this is the list that it was paired with. And this version of the list you'll see is very, very similar, except that what it does is it's still got the two robot paramedic um, Oko lists, but it cuts the second Psychop three-man Harry's team for a Peeler Total Reaction Bot, a Cyber Ghost, and a Flash Pulse Bot. I'm not 100% sure what the circumstance I would have run this list in, list in is. I originally had plans to use this if I thought I would play Test Run in the variant Highly Classified that we played, but after one game of playtesting, I realized that the only veteran in the entire list is the Psychop, and I really need two veterans in case my opponent picks that Undermine. So I won't even really run this in Highly Classified, it's possible I would have run this as an emergency drop if I had expected something like bear pods, because you really do kind of want a total reaction bot there, except that, frankly, even the Psychops are pretty good against bear pods because they're MSV1. So not sure when I would play this, other than I did play it once during testing, and it was totally fine. So this is my opponent's list for the first game I would play, which is game two of the event. So game two on day day one. And this would be against Drews. Now, Drews are a faction that have... They haven't ever had a glow up, but they've just slowly been getting better over time, kind of almost to the point where you wouldn't necessarily notice unless you went back and checked. One of the things this list is missing that I think it would benefit from is diggers, and you can put diggers in a bruise drawler core, and they're 14 points and stay pure. This list doesn't have that, but it does have the EM LGL, and the EM and normal plus one damage LD LGL in the Druze, they're really the only faction that can still do this, where you have X-Visor, decent ballistic skill, core link modifiers, firing EM grenades. You can't really do this as well with Star Mitre anymore, because Emily Handelman isn't in a pure link. You can, but it's not as good. But it's a capability that remains in Druze. Otherwise, what we've got going on here is we have a five-man link, and it's got a Druze sniper, uh, a brawler decoy or bra brawler lieutenant is actually going to be in this list, a doctor, a hacker, and then the Drew's EMLGL. And then there's going to be a Harris team, which is going to have the second brawler in it, Wolfgang Amadius, and a bounty hunter. We then have, and the rest of these groups, actually, I think this Harris team is actually in this. I've just reconstructed this as best I can. So you might find, yeah, I think there's a good chance that this Harris team was in combat group two. But otherwise, we have two duos of a bounty hunter and a bulleteer. This is going to serve my opponent really well in Rescue, were he to play Rescue, he has to drop from the event. But these are great little duos, and they would be fantastic in Rescue. Then we have two Hunzakuts, 
and a Peacemaker. The Hunzakuts will do very well in the scenario that we are about to play, but overall I think this list could benefit from having basically just two diggers in it, if I'm being realistic, and maybe cutting the Brawler, the Druze Mimetism Sniper for probably not a Brawler Sniper, probably a Brawler Heavy Rocket Launcher. What you're looking for here is really just like a disposable aero piece, because a lot of what you're going to be doing is leaning on the EMLGL. So overall, this is still Druze. They aren't the best faction in the game, but they've gotten way better. And when I dropped into Druze, like I turned up and my first game of the day is going to be Druze. And I'm sitting there being like, I have a Zeta Lieutenant and no chain of command. And I'm playing against Druze. Cool. Let the punish begin. So this is the table, and I will just briefly mention, this is my first game of the day. Uh, the event was going to be two games per day for two days, but I was unable to make the first round. Uh, I'm trying to buy a house with my partner. There was an auction that we had to go to. We really couldn't miss it. And so I told the TO that, and he very graciously just arranged that I would have the buy in the first round. Now, I think it does need to be said this is an advantage. Uh, there are times when a buy is something that you don't necessarily want if you're trying to win an event and the event has insufficient rounds to have a clear winner, then a buy can be really bad because it can scupper your chances of really getting that first place or scoring as well as you could because it's a low scoring win. But in this case, we had, I think, something like 16 players, and we were going to be playing four rounds, which meant that there was going to be a clear winner. And because there was going to be a clear winner, a win is a win. You just have to win four rounds to win that event. And because you have to win four rounds to win that event, you don't have to major every round. So a buy is a buy is a win. A win is a win, basically. Uh, it's a game that I didn't have to play. I got to just turn up at like 2 p.m. in the afternoon, angry about having been outbid on a house, um, and just play a game. I didn't have to play the first round. And on top of that, a low scoring win is not necessarily bad in this circumstance because it meant that I was most likely to play a pair down in a number of future rounds because my score might be a little bit lower than the front runners. And that's actually what happened. This game was a pair down. The Druze player had lost his first round. So I just kind of want to mention that because I think it is really worth noting that you can have these environmental effects that just kind of randomly can give you an advantage. And I had that in this case. I played down this round and I think I actually played down in round three as well. And although those were both cracking games, they, I, like I was playing against opponents who had copped a loss already and who maybe there was like a small or, a small or non-zero skill difference compared to if I played against someone who was undefeated to that point. So with that said, as a disclaimer, here we are coming into round two, and the scenario that we're playing is Sensor Field. Sensor Field has been featured on this channel before, but basically the board is going to be divided into four quadrants, and these quadrants do not fully occupy the space between deployment zones. There's a little gap that doesn't, like you can't deploy a sensor there or there, but what you're trying to do is you're trying to get sensors into every one of the quadrants, and you will score points for getting a sensor into your opponent. If you just deploy a sensor in an, a quadrant of your opponents that has no sensor in it, then you'll score a point. So there are two points for that up for, gra up for grabs. And then otherwise it's supremacy scoring. If you have quadrants, if you have more quadrants with sensors in them at the end of each round, then you will score two points per round. So you score basically immediately as soon as you get an unopposed sensor down in your opponent's uh, table side, and then it's otherwise supremacy scoring. I find this scenario very straightforward and kind of easy to play, but it's not necessarily easy to approach like your first time. Because the sensors are destroyable and there's meant to be a bit of a tug of war back and forth between placing yours and your opponent placing theirs and destroying them, etc., it's easy to find yourself in situations where you have to split your attention between attacking your opponent, placing sensors, and placing and destroying sensors. And if in doubt, really the way to do it is you leave destroying sensors to last. That's one of the last things that you want to do. It is usually easier to place a sensor than it is to destroy them. If you can place a sensor in a good location, they can be very difficult to attack. They can't be placed on terrain or in cover, but they still have two structure. It's really easy to like accidentally fail to destroy one. So my rule of thumb in this scenario is if in doubt, place sensors first. I also like going first in this scenario because I want to be able to place the sensors in my opponent's zone and score them immediately. Because if I get my sensors down in my zones, then my opponent now has to destroy those before he can score his two points for quadrants, uh, for sensors in enemy quadrants. So with that kind of said, um, my opponent won the lieutenant role. And in fact, my opponents would win all three lieutenant roles, I believe, over the course of the two days. 
And I have a moment of like, oh shit, it's going to happen. The punish is real. But my opponent elects to set up second on this side. And so I go first. I snap pick going first because Zeta Lieutenant. Zeta Lieutenant cannot afford to be EM LGL'd, but also I think this scenario really favors going first, as mentioned. Now, this list is built for this scenario, and basically it is built to have enough orders to not have to choose what to do in the first turn. It can attack your enemy, place all of the sensors that you need, and then set up in really frustrating defensive positions. So how we have deployed is from left to right, we have a Varangian guard over here. We have the first of the three-man teams down here. So we've got a Psychop that's actually standing on ARO duty. We have a uh, the helper bot belonging to the engineer who is hanging out. Uh, she's hanging out back there. And the Zeta has reserve drop down next to it once I see my opponent's firepower pieces. We have the group two duo of the Oko and the Roadbot there, they are expecting to move out. So they are positioned very aggressively because they will always have one tack awareness. And then we have the second of the Harris teams here, again, with the Psychop on ARO duty. It's important to note that these pieces are, they're on ARO, but this Psychop is really only watching kind of like to ground level there and down into this space. It doesn't have long lines of fire because this bridge is in the way. This one is more aggressively postured, and I did deploy it before my opponent deployed all of their stuff, but they're kind of just expecting to look into this space and onto this rooftop. Now, they would end up being pinned down by the Drew Sniper, which is going to deploy over here, but the Drew Sniper deploying there exposed them to a lot of danger. We then have the Group 1 Oko Roadbot link over here, and another Varangian Guard prone, ready to impetuous. For my opponent, the Drew's link has come down there. And the EMLGL is nooked down behind this very, very safely, but then the sniper is deployed boulders brass in the open here. Now, this has given me a really difficult choice about my reserve drop, but because the Zeta can take a fight against the sniper not in cover by climbing up here and then moving in this direction, I've chosen to take that fight. Otherwise, the Harris team for my opponent has come down here. Wolfgang is actually standing, but he'll just take some shots and guts prone on the first turn. And we have the uh, we have a plus four armor bounty hunter. And then there's Biker. Uh, there's a Bulleteer back here. Biker there. Bulleteer there. And we've got a Peacemaker has deployed prone down there with the Oxbot hanging out here. And then the two Hunzakuts. Now, these Hunzakuts are actually misdeployed because they can't place multi-scanners on top of buildings, but we kind of, one, ignore that, and two, it's never going to come up because my first turn is going to be pretty savage. So I'm going first, and as a reminder, I have 19 orders in this list. There are three tack aware orders and a lieutenant order, and the list is also extremely order efficient. So my opponent docks orders from the Zeta group, which is probably the right call, and then we begin impetuousing things forward. This Ferengian's got a really clean impetuous to there, so does this one to there. From there, it is mostly the Zeta show for the first part of the, um, the turn. I'm going to climbing plus up onto this um, building here. We're going to take a firefight, which is going to, I'm actually going to take a cross map shot that drops wolf prone and does one wound to him. And after I think maybe two or three orders, we knock this, um, we knock this bulleteer out uh, and it, it goes unconscious. We then move over in this direction and that brings us into face-to-face -face roll with the Drew Sniper. I think we have one face-to-face -face roll that are like crits cancel and then I put it down. I don't put it to dead. I fire armor piercing rounds because I think Drew's a shock immune or at least I rolled armor piercing rounds. But it's down, this bulleteer's down and we've got plenty of orders left at that point, because the Zeta is primarily spending its, its so first firefight is tack aware, second firefight is lieutenant, third firefight is the first regular order out of the pool. We then begin blitzing things forward. So like these guys move in this direction, this way, these guys move in this direction, this way, and I can use tack aware orders for this, but because the robots are so fast and specialists, and I have to get more than four inches forward to start placing the sensors, I'm actually, what I'm doing here is it's usually like the first order is a robot spending a regular order. So this link here is going to end up moving like up to here, place a sensor there, sensor the Hunzakut, uh, sensor bot comes around to here, places a sensor there. I think this takes like a couple of orders. I fail about half of my sensor rolls, but whip 13, you will fail some. And I have so many orders to spend that that's fine. I'm just going to blow through them. And then the, uh, the robot's going to come up onto this rooftop and kill the Hunzakut. It'll go on. It'll go into no wounding cap from a um, a shotgun template, but it will put the Hunzakut down. On this flank, the Psychop, I think, actually gonna, is going to move up and around this way along the rooftops and put down a bounty hunter that is there. And this link team, the combat group two, is going to move kind of up and around this way, and we're going to get a sensor down there. 
And at this point, we kind of run into trouble. I move the Peacemaker to this position. Sorry, not the Peacemaker, the um, the Ochre Copper Bot to this position here, which is all well and good, but that puts me in inside hacking area of the Peacemaker. Now, I kind of just accept that it's only a, a um, Whip 12 Brawler hacker. I, I basically want to put myself in a position where it messes with my opponent, and I am lucky enough that uh, the, the Peacemaker fails to... Um, the, the hacker fails to put the uh, Oko down. Now, I think I have like two attempts at isolating the Peacemaker and fail, and I'm getting low on orders at this point. Group one is almost totally spent. So what we do is we're like, I'm going to secure that last point, and we're going to do it this way. So the cat has ended up somewhere about there. I say cat, right? The roadbot in, cat, in um, bike form. It ends up coming around this way, around to there, and it places a sensor there. And then on the last order of the turn, I pop up to here. And that's it. That's all that it does. Uh, it is opposed by a submachine gun, standing submachine gun hacker, and the viral pistol drews here. And they like flail at it. It's fine. I think it spangs a viral hit, and it adhesive launches them. And they both succeed the adhesive launcher, and I just stop there. And this is exactly the kind of thing that I managed to do multiple times with the robots, basically both in testing and over the course of the game, is I just put this thing there, and actually let's go to a picture like this, and I just say, this is your problem now. This thing has mimetism, dodges on 15s, has a Panzerfaust, has an adhesive and like an uh, a, a riot stopper, a big one. It's able to catch both of those at this range. The perspective makes it look a bit off, but I'm at like exactly 10 and a half on her and I can place the template there and it expands out like that. And this is just like, this is just a hot mess for my opponent. This thing is a huge pain in the ass that he's now going to have to spend his entire turn kind of dealing with. And that brings us back to the game state that Sensor Field creates. So I've had a good first turn. I've I've killed one model, two models, a couple of irregular pieces. My opponent is only down two regular orders and like I think two irregular, right? I killed this biker and this one's a good. So I've knocked out four pieces, only one of which is particularly expensive or important. But because I've also placed all of the sensors that I need to, my opponent is now in a position where they have 11 orders and they need to place their own sensors, kill my sensors, and counterattack the, the pieces that I've moved forward. And it is going to be almost impossible for them to do all three of those. In fact, I've probably hit them hard enough that it's going to be impossible for them to do two. And that is, in fact, the case. The Zeta is literally standing boulders brass here, but there's just not a lot my opponent can do because he's spread too thin. What is going to happen is that there is going to be a massive hot mess in this part of the table as my opponent desperately tries to put the roadbot down. The first thing that happens is that the link activates, the Druze moves forward um, and fires three shots, viral pistols, good range into the um, the roadbot. And he inflicts, I think, something like five, he crit and a hit. And he, so he does five saves to me. I'm in the open. Damage 12 versus BTS 3. I fail two of them. And because it's a roadbot, what that means is that it enters in, it goes unconscious, then goes unconscious level two. And because that happened in the same order, it then chooses to activate no wound incapacitation. So it took two wounds and is effectively still standing. And the, ad acrylic, the adhesive launcher has glued both the hacker and the, um, and the LGL. So we still have a conscious roadbot here, and this link team is glued. And so then we have the Peacemaker basically move up and take long-range shotgun shots. And it takes that fight, and it basically gets double-hacked through my uh, my Oko, and I think it gets isolated. And like eventually, eventually enough things are brought to bear where he exhausts my Panzerfaust and is eventually able to put the roadbot down but it just takes a lot. This Harris team then has a crack at moving out across this bridge, but there is covering fire. Uh, the robot obviously is still alive for some of that as well. And so Wolfgang and the Brawler both go down, but the um, the Bounty Hunter gets to here and basically, I remember I've got an Oko here. He tries to fight both and actually doesn't, doesn't have enough orders to either destroy the sensor or the Oko, so both survive. He's gonna die the next turn. It's going to be rough for him. So at this point, my opponent has placed zero sensors, has killed zero sensors. Uh, this Hunzukut comes across here and places a deployable repeater. And there is an attempt at doing some hacking, except that the brawler, th there was going to be an attempt at doing some hacking, except that the hacker got glued. So we do have a repeater down there. Um, I wonder what actually came of that. I can't remember. But anyway, and so my opponent at this point has to just try and dodge. And so my opponent tries to, he's got like three, four orders left. And so he goes for a dodge on this link. Basically with the idea being that 
one of these two pieces will probably dodge clear, and whichever one does will try to either get my Zeta or EM Grenade my Zeta. I've set aside four command tokens, assuming I'd be in loss of Lieutenant on my turn, but what actually happens is it's the Druze um, EM LGL that breaks free, it's still in a four-person link, and it puts three grenades into the Zeta, and it just whiffs all of them, because the link is down from five models to four. Now, if he'd hit one, I've got four command tokens. My plan would just be to play through my turn. Turn of loss of lieutenant, four command tokens, basically doable, but he whiffs everything. And so I'm totally fine. I don't feel like I would have been in the worst position. In fact, I think I would have still been in an incredibly dominant position, even if I had gone into loss of lieutenant because I'd accomplished so much on my first turn. So here this, here's the game state top of two, and we can see, um, yep, this Psychop team has moved out. The Varangian has actually impetuous since the beginning of the first turn, beginning of the turn. The Zeta is hanging out at, up here, bold as brass, and everything else has kind of just moved forward. And I believe this is the last picture I have, because we are basically going to be... This is one of those turns where you begin the turn by doing retreat math and you know it's going to be a bad time for your opponent when that happens. But I don't have to place any sensors. I have a wounded sensor over here, but I've successfully placed a sensor over here with the robot paramedic. I have a sensor here, and I have a sensor here. So I still have sensors in all four zones. I have the luxury of just punching my opponent until they are within an inch of their life on this turn, and so that's what I'm going to do. There's not a great deal to be said other than that. So we have, we have a... Um, an armor for Bounty Hunter over here. This Psychop is going to move out in this direction and just have gunfights with it, firing armor-piercing rounds until it dies. So we put that down, and then we basically run a Varangian Guard all the way up here to put shots into this link. And we just otherwise, we clean things off. And I actually have to sit there and do retreat math, but the basic goal is to, if we can, kill my opponent's lieutenant, but if not, just trim them down to the point where they have maybe four orders. Four or five orders, 77 points remaining. And so they end their turn with, I want to say, this bullet here is still alive. There are a variety of glued things and conscious things over here. And that's basically it. Uh, they have nothing really left on the side of the table that can meaningfully contest stuff. All of their specialists are pinned way back here. Uh, this Hunzukut, I believe, dies to something. And... It's effectively the game. There is no way for my opponent to come back. I don't remember what classified I had. I know I had one, and I know that I do it. Uh, I think it was something like sensor the HVT, but I'm not 100% sure. And really, we're just in too dominant a position for there to be a recovery. Uh, in exactly the same way as on the first turn, my opponent was already on the back foot, having to choose between placing their scanners, destroying my scanners, and attacking me. Uh, my opponent now is in the same position, but they just have they have nothing left. They make a really game Hail Mary, trying to basically push out this Varangian, and they lose pieces doing it. And that puts them over the retreat threshold, but it's too late for that to matter, because I'm going to have one more turn, and there's going to be nothing left for them to do. We, we play out a few things, basically, but there's really nothing else left in the game, and so that's a 10-0 that's a win. Uh, that's a 10-0 win my way, going into... So that's the end of the second round. Remember, I have a buy in the first round, a uh, 10-0 win in the second round, and we roll into round three on day two. So that's coming up soon, and I hope you enjoyed it.